Champions process the highs and lows of life in a very special way. They see setbacks as a way to grow. And they know that with hard work and a little effort, anyone can do just about anything. This attitude applies to racing. It's also something that we all see here in Silicon Valley. It's the entrepreneurial mindset. And it's one that's really at the center of the character that is Stanford. Here's what Sir Jackie Stewart, Formula One champion, has to say about the ability to drive a race car fast. The mental attitude to hone it, manicure it, and shape it is going to make the difference between being a good middle of the road driver and someone quite special. We have two quite special people with us here tonight. In the conversation to come, we're gonna hear from racing champions Patrick Dempsey and Patrick Long. They're gonna talk about success, failure, and what it takes to be a winning team. So please join me in welcoming Patrick Dempsey and Patrick Long. Hey, it's quite a walk to get in here. How are you? Good evening. All right, welcome to Stanford. Thank you, it's great to be here. So I'm gonna give you a little deeper introduction for each of these fine gentlemen because they have accomplished a lot. And I'll start with Patrick Dempsey. So Patrick began his motorsports journey when his wife Jillian got him off the couch and gave him a gift certificate to the Skip Barber Racing School. <laughs> he, he attended that school and then another at the Paynos Racing School and this led him to a career as a race car driver. And a very impressive one at that. Among many accomplishments, he has achieved on the track two podium finishes at the 24 Hours of Daytona. Big deal. A podium at the 24 Hours of Le Mans. And a victory in the World Endurance Championship at the six hour race at Fuji last year. And for those of you who know, Fuji is really hallowed ground. It's a place where people like Lauda, Hunt, Andretti, and Krasnoff all raced. It's an amazing place. He is currently the co-owner of the Dempsey Proton Porsche racing team that competes in the World Endurance Championship, which I will henceforth refer to as the WEC. And he is taking a break from racing, and actually from driving, uh, more precisely, in 2016, to focus on both his family and also this other career he has in the entertainment industry. <laughs> On that note, he has a production house called Shifting Gears, which has several exciting projects in the works, all of which I think will be very interesting to this audience, in particular one called The Limit, which is the story of Phil Hill's 1961 championship season. I can't wait to see it. So welcome, Patrick, to Stanford. Thank you very much. Pleasure. <laughs> very nice to be here. All right, Patrick Long. <laughs> Patrick Long has been a Porsche factory driver since 2003 and is the sole American representative to that squad. His career reads like the history of sports car racing. He is a three-time American Le Mans GT driver's champion. He is a Pirelli World Challenge GT champion and is a Patron Endurance Cup driver's champion. Out of 100 career IMSA starts, and this is still a rolling total, he has won an amazing, a mind-blowing 24 races. And along the way, he picked up a few nice items for his trophy case. So he has one win at the Rolex 24 at Daytona. He has two 12 hours of Sebring wins, two wins at the 24 hours of Le Mans, and three Petit Le Mans wins. Pretty amazing. Thank you. What I, uh, what I admire the most about Patrick is that I think he fits into this grand tradition of American drivers who can drive just about anything and really want to. People like um, Dan Gurney and uh, Parnelli Jones. He has the ability to be successful in a range of cars. He's been in everything from an Australian V8 supercar to a Porsche prototype with Penske Racing to NASCAR and ARCA stock cars and even class 12 off-road buggies. And by the way, he actually won the Baja 1000 in one of the latter. It was pretty awesome. 
having started in carts as, as a lad of just six, at the age of 16, he traveled to Italy to hone his craft in the rough and tumble of European racing. And he actually spent seven years there winning in both carts and open, open wheel cars. Last year, he teamed with Patrick Dempsey and Marco Seafried in the WEC and also raced with Team Falcon Tire in IMSA. And this year, he's going to be driving over 20 races, right? Yep. That's a lot of races in the Pirelli World Challenge Series and in the WEC. And just a little over two weeks ago, he came in a very, very, very close second in the Daytona 24, which was really amazing to see. He is a truly, that was a great, that was a great race. He is a, he is a truly passionate Porsche aficionado. He is the ringleader of a cultural movement celebrating the joy of being air-cooled, <laughs> which we'll talk about a little later. And most of us here at the REVS program really hope that he runs for president in 2020. Yeah. <laughs> welcome, Patrick. We won't go there. <laughs> so welcome to Stanford, guys. Um, so I always like to start off these things, since we are at Stanford, kind of this hallowed academic institution, with a fine tradition of doing something a little more academic flavored before we start talking about auto, automobiles and the like. So if we could, oh, there it is. There's this graphic. This is actually the seal of Stanford. Um, and you can see it has the Palo Alto tree on it and it has the founding date, 1891. And what's really interesting about it is that it has a little German phrase on there, a motto for the university. And I was actually wondering, you're, you're multilingual. Could you actually, do you mind reading that? Because my German is horrible. I felt a quiz coming on. <laughs> um, so we're, we're going to start with. You don't have to translate it. Just the, the, the German stuff there with the word Luft in there. Yeah, well, of course, the, the air. Oh, do you don't have to translate it? Could you read it, the German? Oh, you want me to just yeah, read yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Die Luft der Fleihelfeld. Oh, right. great. Right. So I, uh, there's no way. I'm I sure could. someone can do it a little better in this audience <laughs> than that, but um, some, probably some native speakers. And as you're starting to translate it, the way Stanford talks about this is it, it, it stands for let the winds of freedom blow. And it has a special significance to the university because it was actually a favorite phrase of David Starr Jordan, who is the founding president of this university. And he loved it because he felt it stood for academic freedom, intellectual freedom, and this kind of indefinable West Coastness uh, that is Stanford, because it was a startup then, right? And its, its competitors, so to speak, uh, were places like Harvard on the East Coast, which might be seen as a little more stuffy uh, than Stanford. <laughs> but the most interesting thing is that this is actually a German translation of a Latin text that goes back to Martin Luther. Very interesting. And so uh, former president of Stanford, Gerhard Kasper, actually wrote a very long treaties on this, which you can Google, and I just have an excerpt here, in which he says, the Latin word aura can be rendered various ways. The German term Luft means air rather than wind, right? Though wind is clearly appropriate. Indeed, one might argue that der Wind der Freiheit weht would have been a better translation of the Latin into German. So there you have it. We have an authority saying it's actually air, not wind, in the motto. So perhaps it better reads as, let the air of freedom blow. That's OK. Um, but I thought, you know, we're here at REVS in the Automotive Innovation Lab. I think for this audience, my preferred translation would be something much more like, let your freedom be air-cooled. <laughs> <laughs> and so I think what we've explored here and, and really gotten to tonight is that Stanford, in his DNA, is an air-cooled institution. Good. And open garage, Porsche, two Patricks, and a German motto, it had to be. This evening was destiny in the history of Stanford. All the threads lead to this moment. You know, Patrick was just asking me what we're doing here, so now he finally <laughs> <laughs> I've I'm, learned I'm, so much already. <laughs> I'm glad one of you knows, or one of us knows. Um, so what I'd actually like to do is um, give you a chance to see these, these guys in action. Sports car racing is a really interesting sport because it's one of the few sports where the team really shares a common um, thing together in the form of, you know, with you guys, a Porsche 911. And you, as I've said with the, uh, their amazing record, they spend hours and hours and hours in the same seat sequentially, racing together, sharing everything together. And we wanted to give you a really visceral feel for the amazing accomplishments that these two gentlemen had in 2015. So we have a little highlight from last year's season. If we could cue that up and roll it. 
and then we'll discuss it. Oh, it's nice to be here, you know, and uh, we had a good warm up and good practice and qualifying was okay. I think we'll be good for the race and, you know, just really trying to enjoy it and um, see how the race unfolds, quite honestly, but to just relax and remember how special it is to be here. Here's the Dempsey 77 Proton Porsche with Townsend Bell driving the Ferrari behind and Townsend Bell coming around the outside. Patrick Long is not letting him go through. You can't go through there, Townsend. You should know that. Oh, he spun out. Too much acceleration out of Arnage. And Patrick Dempsey knows how important that is. Brilliant performance by the team and by Patrick Dempsey. A place on the podium at Le Mans. Look at the emotion. I am so happy to be here. I to be up here. We performed at Le Mans, achieved more than what our goal was, uh, got a podium and that was mission accomplished and then it was about resetting our goals. Uh, it was to back it up and to get a podium in one of the shorter races which would be even a stronger challenge. After finishing just off the podium at the Circuit of the Americas in Texas, it was time for the final three races in Asia, starting with the six hours of Fuji in Japan. Did a lot of simulation work uh, to help for Japan and uh, call and strategy on the fly made great calls and then had good pace in the wet and uh, positioned us and then Marco just had a phenomenal drive in his middle stint that just, you know, he checked out on the field and really, you know, put us in a really good position uh, for Patrick to take over and then I got a chance to, to close it and to win my first race at Fuji, you know, which is pretty extraordinary. It was uh, a lot of pressure in that last stint for me, you know, just to stay calm and manage the emotions and stay focused. Their first win in GT um, in the WEC for Patrick Long, Marco Seyfried and Patrick Dempsey. So, <laughs> <we're>, <laughs> congratulations, that thank was you, amazing. Thank you. So we're here to talk about the mindset of a champion and what really struck me about that video is this moment right after you've won, or sorry, not won, you've been on the podium for arguably the biggest race in the world. And you're talking about, let's reset our goals, let's go after a bigger challenge. And what is it in your backgrounds for the two of you that makes you say, you know, I'm not content to just sit back on my laurels to rest on them, that I've got to raise the bar and go after something bigger? For me, it's um, sort of an aspect of being a part of a team that I appreciate more the further I go down the road in this career. Um, it, it used to be something that was sort of pushed into my mind as a youngster. You know, you need a good team. You need people around. You need the right people. You need to be working in the right direction. But the light bulb started to click the further I went into my career. And for me, it was about goal setting for my own focus, but also to sort of be a ringleader. As drivers, a lot of times we're sort of the front men of our team. And if our heads are down when we walk in on Sunday morning to go racing, it doesn't set a great precedent for everybody else who's been up all night prepping the car. So some of it's that fake it till you make it the psychology where you really just keep reminding yourself where we're going, where we're driving forward. And the, and the only analogy I could give is when you're out on a long run and you, you pick the next tree to get to or the next signpost and then when you're there, you pick the next goal. And so I think it's just keeping your mental direction heading forward. I want to ask you, Patrick, um, uh, just to build on that, there's this sense of um, that you can actually work hard to get better at something. And, and I, I find your story so compelling because it's not often you see an adult being willing to move from one success to a completely new domain where you're going to have to work really hard and uh, put in a lot of effort to get to some level of competence. And you don't even know where it may end up. So what's it like for you? being on the podium at Le Mans and then working with someone like Pat here who's actually saying, you know what, we gotta, we gotta raise the bar and go higher. How do you, what do you, what is it in your history that lets you actually get to that point and succeed? It's the process, I think, is the most important thing. Um, the journey. It's still very moving. <laughs> yeah, I bet. <laughs> to see it, you know. It's, uh, It's really hard to articulate what that means because of the sacrifice of the team and the journey and being in the moment, being in the now. Because you look back and it's like, geez, we did something remarkable. But when you're there, you're, you're breathing. You know, it's about the air. And being able to be present is the most remarkable thing about racing and the experience. And I think that's 
when you achieve the goal, you have to remember to reset and go, okay, where are we now? Where are we in this moment? Where are we breathing? And then the emotion will come later, you know? Wow, so that ability to be in the moment and, um, and kind of know what that feels like is something that you keep going back to. You're totally present. There is no distraction. Your situational awareness is so keen. And you, your time is continuum. You, you know that this moment will occur in that you've been past, present, and future all at once. And that is what is the most exciting thing about racing and the challenge is to be in that space mentally, which is beautiful. And it's, you know, very quick and elusive to be there. And you'll have a race, you'll have a moment like that. And you'll see, you know, I remember the moment when I was watching Patrick in um, Townsend racing. And, you know, you guys know each other. And I knew they were going to be clean. And it, the sportsmanship in that. And you think back about Dan Gurney. You think back about um, the racers of that era had to protect each other. Because if there was a mistake, there was death involved. Immediately. It was over. And these guys at this level were racing so beautifully and so cleanly that it's one of those moments that I'll never forget. And he's completely oblivious because he has no idea that anybody's following the GT race at all anyway because nobody usually cares because the LMP1 program is so dominant. And he's the front line to this world feed. And we're watching this unfold. And it's just remarkable, remarkable. It really is. And I, I want to go back to this, this point you, you brought up about being mindful and being in the moment. Because, yeah. you know, You've been racing since you were six. Your history in the sport is more recent, so yeah. I, I assume that you have a perspective on it as an adult that you know you have, it's been your whole life. Um, but I guess my question is, for you, you had a background before as an athlete. You were a champion skier, yes. you know, a balanced sport and unicycling and all these great things. So it's not the first time you've been in a sport where you need to really be on the edge and know what it feels like. But when it comes to being in the cabin of that 9-11, how much do you feel that your ability there is innate? How much of it is just plain hard work? Oh, it's hard work because it, it's, I'm sure a lot of people in the audience have raced and they've been in a car. It's a physical activity. I don't think, if you haven't done it, you don't realize how much the temperature, uh, the lower body, the pressure under braking, and then you're in there for two or three hours. And the great drivers have the stamina and the ability mentally and physically to relax to do that and drive that. And, and that's the real challenge. And how do you, you know, block that out and to stay present? Is the mindfulness of it is what I really love. And the world in which you compete, there is a camaraderie that is unlike anything else. That you're out there, you're fighting with someone, and the next minute, you and Townsend are on the podium laughing about this situation. And there's, there's a purity to it still, even at the highest level of the professionalism. And, and of course, me coming into it much later in life, you know, and successful in other realms, your ego has to be eliminated. You can't worry about your ego. You have to just go, okay, how do I get better? You know, and in endurance racing, you have three other drivers, so you have your role in the team. What do you do? And then constantly seek to learn and to Remember, I remember there was a moment in Daytona many years ago. I'm like, what am I doing here? You know, I'm successful in another world. I don't need to do this to myself. And I was remember, remember to be, become a beginner again. And that was the key. And that's sort of, I think, answering your question. Oh, that's a, I, I love that. Um, speaking of beginners, I mean, you've worked with dozens of other race drivers, both as team members, but also as helping them develop and coaching them. What's your sense of that question of innate talent versus it's just something that you've got to grind out and work hard on? I think it's like anything. It's a, it's a combination of, of both. Um, I think the best were the, the, when I look back, are the ones that were so gifted but worked tirelessly as well. But I think everybody um, picks it up a little bit differently. I think what, what Patrick's um, revealing is, is that if you're vulnerable and willing um, and you have, of course, drive and, and the, the nature to put a lot of work into it. But I think it goes back to you against yourself and the mental spirit. Everybody talks about the sport of driving is um, a battle between two or three or four, but it's actually a battle against yourself, which comes right back to, um, I think that there's a lot of it is innate in how you can sustain pressure and how you can deal with yourself is probably the, the biggest challenge. There's a great quote that we, we, um, we were, I think the, 
we were training for Le Mans, and we were at Jim Hall. This is a karting track in, in Southern California. And there's this little post-it on the wall, a tiny little thing. And we're, I'm like, what is that? And it was a quote from Phil Hill that was about a, a fencer from Germany. And he said, the battle is really within yourself and how you, that becomes what it means to be a champion, not your fellow competitor but how you can push yourself outside your comfort level and still continue to ex succeed. And, and I'll, I'll never forget that. When, and that was like, oh, that's it. That is, that is it right there. <laughs> this little post-it, you know, in a trailer in the middle of Oxnard. And I was like, wow, that's... <laughs> <laughs> what a great message that is. I mean, that's the beauty of it. It's like, you're on this journey and you're evolving as a person and as a champion. What does a champion mean? And, you know the failures and the successes and the little treats along the way will guide you when you're open and you're present, which is situational right. awareness, which is right. racing again. Right. How do you, could you talk about a specific challenge or setback that you guys encountered as a team last season where you put that post-it to work? How did you, like, can you tell a story about how you worked through something that maybe other people would have just given up at that point? Uh, for me, the, the, the kind of tool that I reach into when that adversity strikes is, is putting everything in a perspective. Um, racing is such an emotional game that you have a great race and you're like, this is the best thing. And then you have one bad session the week after and you're like, I suck. I don't know how to do this. Why am I here? What's going on? And that's just that normal emotion. So on Monday morning when we had some setbacks, we had a tough race in Nürburgring where a door fell off. Uh, or a window blew off and we had to replace the door. And we had a podium too. We yeah, we had so many places where we had fought back from being in the trenches and we, we thought we had it on a plate and then it slipped out from underneath us. And this sounds cliche, but I would just kind of come back to, okay, this is sport. This is, we're going to live to see another day. Reshift, refocus, decide what, what matters from the takeaway and then push forward. And I think that that's in any point in racing, there's so many highs and lows and more lows than highs that you have to have that, that groundwork to go back to and, and re, refocus. And the lesson in that too, I think the failures are the ones that teach you the most. Like for me, it was Austin, the second stint was horrendous. But the next race was, you know, Japan. So I learned that my vision at night was terrible and I had other issues that I needed to go back into the gym and train for and then we, I came back refreshed in, in Japan, and it was sort of, you know, had I not had the experience, I think, at Austin at that moment to work harder in those two weeks down, I wouldn't have been in a position mentally and physically for Japan. You, so you literally took a setback, like realizing, wow, I need to, this driving at night thing is tough, and you learn some other things, and next race you guys win. What a great story. Yeah, and then also, too, that it, when it's your day, it's your day. What is yours cannot be lost. What isn't cannot be held. So it's like you have that aspect of it too. When it's like, oh, it's just not your day. It's not going to be your, your moment. And then today you can feel it. It's like, oh, today's the day. You can feel it. You got, I got up in the morning and I could hear it. In the, it, it was the rain and the bamboos. It's so, in like your Japan and Fuji. It's like, oh my God, it's like you're zen, right? It's beautiful. But that's the, the beauty of motorsport and I think sport in general. and create, it, There is a, a beautiful zen religious aspect to it. When you're attuned, it all happens. And when you're not, the car doesn't run. The setup is wrong. And it's an extension of what's going on. Let's talk more about that. That's fascinating. So let's say you're, you're not in Japan, unfortunately, but you're in... China. The, the oh, well, I was going to say, <laughs> I was gonna say you're in the paddock of, of Le Mans. It's the, it's, it's the day, right? And mm -hmm. it's been a crazy week. A lot of stuff going on. What do you guys do in terms of rituals or the prep you do? How do you get into that mindset you were just discussing where you know you're going to be at peak performance? Like, how do you get to peak athletic performance? It's interesting. It's something we've worked on really a lot mm -hmm. this past, well, three years, but specifically in 2015. Um, I think that what you need is that zen, if you will. You need to go in feeling ready, feeling prepared, like you studied for the test. And um, a lot of that is, I think, the mental... Um, endurance and, and having that mental ease, you can wind yourself up. You saw the excitement on the screen. You can get so wound up about being at Lamar, or being at Fuji or not screwing up or winning or whatever it is that by the time it's time to get strapped in and spend three hours where you don't even blink, let alone drink or breathe, 
you're, 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 you're fried before that even comes up. So it was all about preparation, organization, and finding whatever works for you specifically. Young drivers ask me all the time, what should I eat, what should I drink, how should I sleep, you know, should I do this? I'm like, do what works for you, think about your best day and how it felt, how it looked, how it smelled on that day, and think about what you did to put yourself in that mindset to be there, and just recreate that. Everybody's different, but as long as you walk in to sit at that desk to write that test and you feel prepared, you know what that feeling's like. Your, your shoulders are back and down, and you're like, I got this. Yeah. It's almost like you can make your own luck by being prepared. Yeah. Oh yeah, mentally you have to visualize it. It, it started with Dr. Valazar when we were at uh, Silverstone, and we were just getting into the car, and there was a real methodical approach to, okay, what is, what is it that we need, what do we want to achieve? We want to get on the podium at Le Mans. What is our strength, what is our weakness, and what is the process to get us there? And, and once that was laid out, I thought, with the way Dr. Bowser presented it, you spoke, uh, Jacques, our engineer, spoke, and we, we took stock at what we needed to do. And then it was basically about the process at that point. And then you take one step at a time, and then when you're there, it, it happens. And, and, and that's the remarkable thing about last year is what I learned. And, and I take that now into my life at home and, and work. And essentially, what we said, you know, riding the tides or when you get the cards, you can be prepared, you can know the whole drill, but in racing, there are so many things outside of your control that, like Patrick said, you have to play well when you get the cards. You don't always get the cards and you have to know when it's your day. And I think mm -hmm. that there's that combination in racing that can really send you in those emotional peaks and valleys. And, and that's the, the one little asterisk is always remember there's 99 things that are outside your control. Right, there's an example. We were at Daytona last year and uh, we had a sensor in the tire uh, malfunction. Something happened. And we had to come in. And we were running. We were up there and I was running with everybody. I was like, oh, this is going to be a great race. And then all of a sudden, boom, we're down. And we're, we're five minutes in the pit and we can't get out. And I'm like, all right, so here's where the mental discipline comes in. So what is my job now as a professional? What do I have to do? I have to stay calm and I have to hit my marks and do what I need to do. This is out of my control. The B factor is Jacques Delaire, a guy we work with uh, on the mental aspect of sport. And, uh, and the B factor being, this is out of your control. You can't control that. So you let it go and you just focus on the next step. And slowly but surely, we made our way back to getting on the podium. And, and like, that's the, the thing is really what your mindset is. And also too, when you visualize, there is a chemical, there is a cell building process that happens in that. And, and, and it's truly remarkable. What have you two learned about how to give feedback and receive it? It's something everybody, struggles with in life, but you guys get so much feedback. I mean, literally. Well, the data never lies, yeah, right? Because we have so data. much yeah. going yeah. Yeah. It's like, well, I, I did, I broke there, I had, and you're like, no, <laughs> it's right here. You need to go 200 feet deeper. And, you know, I'm an amateur driver. You know, I started in my late 30s and 40s, and now I, I just turned 50. So I'm with uh, drivers that you started when you were a kid, you, you know, so your instinct. There's a great quote that Senna talks about you know, about, you know, you do it over and over again and it eventually becomes your instinct, right? You have to train your instinct. And, you know, I, I have no instinct whatsoever. I'm trying to train everything at one time. And y you're like, you, you have to be open to be told that you're not there. And then how do you go about doing it? So once again, your ego has to be completely removed from the process in order to move forward. And you look at this year in the Super Bowl, Peyton Manning was benched, right? And look what he did. He, he knew enough to go back to let the defense win that game. And it's like Jackie Stewart. Well, you know, you had mentioned him. What do I need to do to win the race? And all those voices start to come up. And it's, that's a test of a true champion is when he wasn't about him anymore. You know, Jackie he Stewart. knew Jackie Stewart yeah, and yeah. also uh, Peyton Manning. You know, he, right. he did what he needed to do. Yeah, they, they both talk about this idea of, like you said, getting rid of your ego, yeah. taking all the emotion out of the moment so you can just be there and be with the machine. But present, you need some passion. Though. See, yeah. see, that's the fine line. It's I, like, like how do you have ready. the passion yeah. without it overriding you and, 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 and getting in your way? That's, I think, the real challenge, to keep that flow yeah. emotionally going. But the ego thing, it must be so hard because, I mean, present company excluded, most race car drivers have pretty big egos. Like, uh, I mean, you kind of have to. Or is that, is that an unfair statement? Well, there's an ego and then there's cockiness. Yeah. And there's two different things. Yeah. And the really good drivers have an ego, but yet there's a twinkle and a fun in it. And you want to be competitive and you'll blow it out and you'll get passionate. But 
there's something in it that's very special, I find, within the, just being in the world of drivers. You know? I mean, yeah, you're, I think, this is, I think being behind the wheel, ego helps you. Um, it drives you to do things that are repetitive, that are stupid, that are brave, that are, it, it's, it's really good, but when you're outside of the car, it can inhibit you, it can impair you, um, it can challenge your decisions and direction. So I think when you're strapped in, like Patrick says, and you're fully immersed, I think that it's something you have to have, and that's why you see this parallel of the personality outside the car and being a brilliant driver in the car. But I think that my heroes and some of the best drivers can turn it on and off, and I think that that's not only turning it off when they get out of the car, but in the car, sometimes they can turn it off to make good judgment. And you, you see these passionate guys who you know, throw the steering wheel at their competitor and lose their minds after they've thrown it in the sand trap versus you know, the, the guy like uh, Tom Christensen. He's such a gentleman. He's such an astute you know, personality to be in the room. He's just this easygoing guy, but when he's in the car, you know, he, can, he, can, he can turn it on and off. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. He is a remarkable human being. The thing, too, is when, you know, the greatest, if you ever go to a race, get into the pits and listen to what the drivers are saying to the engineers. Everybody has a different style. Like, Andy Lally will be very <laughs> passionate in his critique of the car. And then Patrick can be, you know, is very analytical, very calm, and it's just a complete shitstorm going on around him. And he's as calm as can be in the situation. And it's, it's such an, an amazing insight. And it makes you love the sport even more when you can hear it from that perspective. And I think that's, we're going to a different subject, that, but that's what's missing with the televised mm -hmm. version of these races these days, I think. I had the opportunity to actually sit in Patrick's pit and be on the radio for the whole race at Laguna Seca, and I will corroborate what he's saying. Yeah. It's, it's very vivid. It's almost 3D in your ear. It's, it's, it's an amazing great. experience. It is an amazing experience. <laughs> um, it's illuminating. <laughs> so um, you talked about Peyton Manning. Is there, do you, do you have... Are there, are there other athletes or an athlete that you look to outside of motorsport who you just say, wow, I just admire what they do so much. I've learned so much from that person. Really for me, I think bits and pieces of things that I pick up that I, I can, you know, something like we, t we take away where they're ferocious in the sport and then outside they're able to be this whole different light. But uh, not, not one, is, one in, in mind. How about it's easier for me to do it with a, an, an athlete than it is for a, a, an actor for some reason. I, don't, I think maybe it's the same reason you do. <laughs> Tell but, us what you think about Hollywood. <laughs> well, I'm very grateful for whatever it's given me. <laughs> that was because it lets me go racing. Um, but, you know, the thing, there's a great book, if you, uh, The Champion's Mind. It's just an amazing book if you get a chance to read it. It, it talks about, you know, gold medal performances in everything you do. And, 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 in, in that, there is a, a quote about, if you identify a champion of greatness, then you're identifying in yourself, which means don't judge another person. If you're seeing something negative in someone, you're seeing that in yourself, and you're projecting it. So you need to own the champion. So see the goodness in that. And I think that's what you look for, I think, in an actor or anybody in business or anything like that, is there is there's something about a champion that is God-given, number one, and then there's the work ethic of that. And you, let's just use Peyton Manning because he's hot in, in right now and he's an interesting moment in his, his life and his career, is that his work ethic and his natural ability and certainly you know, where he came from, his family, his upbringing, his environment uh, did that. And, and I think that's what's special about it. You know? And, 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 and each time you look back at the 50s and the 60s, certainly with the limit, you look at Dan Gurney and, and an opportunity to sit and talk with Sir Sterling Moss, and I was like, who out of the Americans that moved over, this is a great generation of drivers who came from America to Europe after the, the war, and this is a whole new world, and it really brought, the SCCA brought back road racing as we know it to this day after that experience. And they're like, Dan Gurney by far is the most remarkable, and I think he's still alive, and I, I don't think been fully honored to his achievements as a driver and as an engineer and as a man and as a champion, and he's got such a, an amazing presence in an or even to this day, that that's special. And to be around that, it just elevates everybody's game and your behavior. And, and so I would say he, for me, in many ways, and the more research I do, is certainly that. Um, we, we have a friend who's at Red Bull, and they train in Santa Monica, and Lindsey Vaughn was in there one day training, and her work ethic was extraordinary. Um, and that's another great champion, what she's done for ski racing and for women. And, and, and in that sport in particular, it's remarkable. 
and there is an aura. There is something about them. And even with Patrick, I, I knew when I'm in the car that you're, something magical is going to happen every time we do something. Every time something happens in a race um, that he has done amazing things. And I, I would say this, you know, but truly there is, there's an energy that is uh, infectious, that you believe that anything is possible and you can achieve it. And, and that's what's really great about being in this sport and being in this world. Hollywood is a different thing. It's not as tangible a result. We, you know, we're going after a win. What is a win in, in, in acting? You know? it's, once, it's being in the moment with your fellow actor at that moment and communicating honestly. That's the win to me. So, so different, the worlds. But yet, in essence, it's the same. It gets back to the air and the breathing. I'm rambling, sorry. <laughs> well, a little deeper on the, on the example of, of athletes that you named, it strikes me with racing is, is a really tough sport because it's a very fragile uh, sport in the sense that we all know of drivers who've made one mistake at the wrong moment, and in a lot of ways their career might be over. There might be bodily harm, but mostly because the politics, and it's hard to take a bet on somebody who's had a bad, really bad moment. With those kind of outcomes at stake, what I'm hearing from both of you is that it's about preparation, it's about day-to-day -day doing the right stuff and taking care of yourself and training really hard and being in the right mental space. How do you balance the two of those? How do you not sit in your Zen garden in Japan and start worrying, you know, what if I lose the rest, what if I lose the race? How do you stay focused on the essential things that you need to do day-to-day -day throughout the year to actually be a champion? Uh, for me, it's back to that first question where you focus on the process. Um, I'm extremely ADHD, and I need to have my goal, my plan, my list, whatever it is that's focusing me forward. And it's interesting working with Patrick because, you know, I'm one of those people who do as I say, not as I do. I, I like to, to preach and coach and, and push Patrick, and I'm, also, I'm almost talking to myself. Like he said, you know, you're, 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 you're looking at someone else, but you're, you're pushing forward, and when you're sharing a car and you're sharing the result, it's sort of uh, an osmosis uh, byproduct where you're sort of um, driving everything forward. But I think when you hear Patrick, he has so much spirit and emotion, and he's really in touch with the energy and everything that's around the motorsport. And that's such a great thing to see and to watch and to really believe in. And it's, it's all right there in front of you. I come from a, a school of thought where you have to block all that. You, you can't smell the roses. You can't soak it up. You have to just be, you know, right, right inside of A, B, and C. And Patrick's shown me that you can enjoy it, and you can still perform, and you can still remove yourself at times and, and look at the, the life perspective rather than the sport perspective. So, um, you know, finding that balance is, is something that I'm still looking, looking for between realizing what kind of opportunities we have and, and all, of, all of that and staying right there in that, that path of driving forward and not getting psyched out by the rain hitting the bamboo and thinking, oh crap, it's pouring rain, rain. how are we going to be, <laughs> worrying about the things again that you right. can't do anything about. It's great to hear how you two as teammates aren't just sharing a seat in the car, but you're actually learning from each other and growing through the course of a season. Mm. Yeah, I think, it's, I think something that worked really well um, is trust. I think that anytime I said something to Patrick, he, he never gave me that response like, well, what do you know? You know, I've been around a lot longer, or I've been successful over here, so I'm a smart enough guy, I can figure this out. It was always like eye contact, trust, and there was a, a connection. And I, I always, you know, we were talking earlier tonight about business, and having partnerships and forging those relationships. And I think essentially it's the same thing in, yeah. in what we did, is, is that you have to have that, you have to fire off each other. You know, if you're, if you're constantly challenging or questioning, your competition just passed you. It's, a, it's chemistry, you know, and I think Marco, who was our co-driver here, I, I wish he was here because he's, he's a completely different energy than Patrick and myself. And, he, he, you know, master mechanic, uh, remarkable man, um, and a very good driver and very internal, but yet when we were trying to put the team together, you know, we needed all of those things to, to come together to balance each other out. And then you, you rely on it because it's a relay race, right? And, you know, everybody has their moment in the car. 
And some days you have a good run, some days you don't, but your teammate picks up that. And, and that is the beauty of it, you know, because you have your team, which is there, the crew, how they prepare the car, you know, what kind of pit stops they make under pressure. Everybody has it. It all has to work so harmoniously. And then you have to have a bit of magic to, to make it pop, to go over the top. And that's what's remarkable about these teams that are so dominant. When you get to that level that there is your engineer, you know, they're very, it's very similar to acting in the sense of that you have a director, right, which is your engineer. And I do better when someone is screaming at me in the ear, you know, and I, I'm getting coached around the track. And we had a breakthrough, I think, when um, the uh, Nürburgring, we were testing, and, and you couldn't make it because you just had your baby, and, and Marco was there. Marco was not someone who talks a lot. So he got on and he started coaching me and looking at the data at the same time of where I needed to go deeper. And something happened in that. This is one of my favorite moments is that, it's, it, that something switched where we came together as a team in that, in that moment for he and I connecting. Um, and that was really special. And then that led to what happened at Japan is like, oh my God, we could win this thing, right? And I'm ch shaking and the media's watching and everything. And I remember the Jackie Stewart, do just what you need to do to win. And then Patrick calmly got on the, you know, on the radio and started t talking me through it, and we and we made it happen. And that was like the beauty of all those moments coming together and crystallizing in that in that specific race. So uh, many of you may not be familiar with everything that Pat Long does, but he is a development coach, driving coach, or develop. You run a big development process for Porsche with young drivers. He also. We were talking a few weeks ago about how much you like going into a team and a new team and helping them get to a different place, almost like they're a startup, like you're a startup coach. And um, I want to ask Patrick about Pat. Okay. Like, what's he like as a teacher and a, and a mentor? How would you, how would be you characterize him? <laughs> oh, he's good. He can be hard ass at times, too. You know? <laughs> he, he basically, there was a great moment where, well, he, first of all, he's a very good coach. And you, know, you can watch him. And he's, the first time we met, I think, was the coach was, we were in Italy, right? We were getting ready for Le Mans. And um, he was just very direct and straightforward and very clear and very simple. Didn't overanalyze. Just, it's like, here's what you need to go do. Do it. And if you get a little cocky, then he tells you to shut up and just get in the car and, and don't look at the data. Don't overthink it. Just drive. And his ability to adapt and to be able to coach you in a, in a nurturing, strong way was great. It's like having a really strong you know, football coach or basketball, whatever you're into. Um, and I think the success I had was really where we started last year. We were going to get in anything possible. We did shifter carts. We did a rally school in Seattle. We did everything possible. And he just put me in a situation um, and just sort of watched. And then when I needed some feedback or an adjustment, he gave it. And I think that's what's great. And his ability to, you know, first of all, a factory driver, really the first really strong American factory driver is an amazing honor and part of his legacy as a driver. So when you think of Dan Gerda, you think of Phil Hill. He's in that category, you know, and to be a part of that and being in this generation next to him is, is inspiring, you know, so I see that as well. And I think the other young drivers that are coming along, he has blazed that trail for them and has set the template for what is expected of an American driver in Europe, where, you know, he's still a California kid, but yet he can understand and be political and stay in the world in Germany and with Porsche and keep the essence of that. And that's what's so beautiful about what he's doing now, you know, with the heritage of the sport and, and the history of the cars and, and what's going on is, is, is pretty remarkable. Pat, turning that around, what's Patrick like as a student? Yeah. Well, I mean, I go, I go back to little time captures in the season. We were in Bahrain, preseason testing, had the track rented, you know, where, where one race car, five crew guys, it's like that perfect training day. And Patrick just had this brilliant long stint. And I come back to what I've learned from my coaches and from, I've not been trained and I don't, I don't claim to be a professional coach. All I'm doing is recreating little bits and pieces that I've picked up along the way. And I just looked at him and I said, you know, right, we just looked at each other in the eye and I was like, he still had his helmet, I was still sweating. And I said, what you just did right there, just stop for a minute and remember. How does that feel? How do you feel right now? How did it feel when you were out there? 
just remember, remember your mindset right now. Are you, do you, have a, do you have a rapid heartbeat? Are you ready to fall asleep? What's going on? And, and all I had from him was trust. I had that vulnerability, that look of, I got it. I'm listening, I'm processing. If you told me right now to do 50 push-ups, I'm not gonna ask you why. And that's in, in order, again, it's vulnerability. In order to grow, you have to just be allowing and you just have to be, uh, you know, right there in the moment and that's that's what he can can do really well and and for someone who's accomplished as much as he's accomplished elsewhere and as many eyeballs and critique that there might be it's an incredible balance to be able to again you can see spiritually he can just be right here at that point and that that's what's allowed him to to find the success as a driver you two have a really remarkable working relationship and thank you for being so open about it and, and uh, it's fascinating stuff so we, we call it REVs for a reason, and we are gonna talk a little bit about cars. And speaking of REVs, and you, you mentioned earlier this idea of you tell drivers sometimes, do as I say, not as I do. Can we roll the video of Patrick driving uh, at Laguna Seca? We have a fantastic video by Marshall Pruitt of you driving a 1967 911S. And by the way, this is not a competitive race, so it's a mixed class. So it's not like you're getting passed by cars with a lot more power than you, but you're doing some pretty remarkable stuff. And then we'll talk Porsches. So can we roll that video? <laughs> So that's a lap of Laguna Seca with Patrick Long. It doesn't, it doesn't look very fast on, on the screen. <laughs> it sounds fast. Yeah, it's it a great video. Great. You should watch all 18 minutes of it. Not every day you get passed by a 908. I know. It's uh, that car that passed me on the right-hand side uh, at about halfway through, what, six, seven million dollar car, you know, just kind of cruising by. That's what you could see. My head was so active is, is that you're out there in a mixed uh, category class and it's a practice session, but everybody's pushing pretty hard. and machinery is worth a little bit more than modern day stuff. So. so in all my research for this, a word that kept coming up that described both of you and your relationship to Porsche was joy. That you just, it's infectious when you're around the cars, you can just tell that you love them. Just wanted to ask you, what does the mark mean to you? What, is, what does Porsche represent to each of you? Uh, there's so many things. I mean, it's, it's hard to put it into one, but I, I Ultimately, if I had to strip it all away um, and only take one thing with me, it would be the, the human relationships across the world that I've made. Essentially, when I, when I strip it all back and I look at Porsche, it's something that a lot of people show up to one space with a common interest, and then you end up learning more about them or their family or 
connecting on many different places. So it's been a vehicle for me to just meet amazing people. Um, and, and when I get into the culture at the car and where they've come and where they are today, I'm just proud. But the relationships is what, what, I, what I hold at the highest level. So it's not just the car. Um, companies are people too, right? How, how, would you, how would you describe the culture at Porsche since you're, you're such an integral part of it? Well, it, it's, you know, when you look at Weissach and Zuffenhausen, where Porsche comes from, you look at the culture of the company, it's about efficiency, innovation, um, it's about doing lots with a small package and being um, such a, a, a company with a lot of turn turnout with without having to be the biggest displacement or the most cars produced when I went to work for them someone said it's the most profitable car company in the world and it's one of the smallest and so right there my first day on the job it's like man you got a you have the, a big precedent precedent to live up to um, but when I go out into the world and I meet the three generation family uh, of a Porsche owner it, it varies so much, and that's the adventure that I love. That's where I can go and, and identify with people along the way that just have that same um, trust and love of, the, of that little rear-engined 911. Patrick, can you maybe speak to some special memory or a first special memory you have with Porsche? Oh, absolutely. I was, uh, definitely. <laughs> you, know, I was, uh, you know, I wanted to be a ski racer. I wanted to be an Olympic champion. And... Um, I was doing a weekend race in Farmington, Maine, and I was having a sleepover with one of the, 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 my teammates. And in his bedroom was a turbo. I think it was, a, it was a 79 turbo. And it was, oh my God, what is that thing? It was black. And that, that was my first moment with Porsche. And then, of course, Risky Business was the second one, right? Huh? Because Maine, you never saw a Porsche on the street, ever. And, and there was something that's aspirational about it, but attainable at the same time and inclusive about Porsche. Different marks are, there's a different mentality. This is a remarkable brand. And now to be, you know, racing with them and to have th that experience. And my first big gig in, uh, you know, big paycheck in, in Hollywood was uh, a movie called Can't Buy Me Love. In that paycheck, I bought a 356, 1963. I still have it. I spent all my money <laughs> <laughs> on this car. And that was, to me, it was like, the classic line is beautiful, it's a work of art, and yet it is so much fun. And you talked about the joy. And to this day, it's still the most fun I have in that car, driving that car. And people come up to you and they embrace you. It's not like another car or a different manufacturer where you kind of alienate them and they don't really like you and they don't give you room to get in. This is like everybody likes you. I don't care who you are, what age you are. Any, there is something that just brings out joy in that. And that's the essence of Porsche, and that has not changed. You know, the whole concept was to go racing. He wanted to go racing. And the family and the company itself, there's a passion there. I mean, it's tough. There is pressure. But yet, there is a joy within every individual you come in contact with. And it's a much higher calling because of what the brand represents. It's no one individual. And I still think, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Porsche now is, is so humble and so loving and so warm and tough at the same time that you know, he's carrying that legacy, and his son is in a different way. And there's something so just invigorating in it and, and inspiring about being a part of that team. You know, and, and, and what's that legacy? Where are you at in that legacy? And you want to live up to what it represents and what it is and what it can be. So, Pat, in, in my introduction, I alluded to the, the fact that you're leading a cultural movement about the benefits of being air-cooled. Could you speak to that a bit more? Uh, I mean... I don't know if it's, if it's all based around the way that that engine cools, but I think what Patrick's speaking to of the heritage, um, when you look at the shape of, of a 356 to a 911 today and you see that evolution, um, when you hear that engine on the video, um, there's something that is just so powerful and engaging. And to me, you know, you take a modern GT3 and it's just an unbelievable weapon. It is a race car for the street, but you get all of that same tone from the flat six. You get that same agility from the rear engine, but if you go back to the 50s, um, it's, it's a whole different experience that, that I love, and that's why you find me driving old race cars like that. It's not that it pays the bills, it's just that 
my hands, the reason my hands look like I was sawing the wheel is because I was on a tire that's about this big and I have a big piece of weight on the rear axle. So I'm like that family with a trailer that's way too heavy and the hitch is way too low and I'm just chasing it. <laughs> so I'm engaged um, by the vintage scene and essentially what I wanted to do was open the doors like you're doing here tonight in these events to people who don't know a lot about the vintage scene and don't know why it's the only thing that I'll talk to Patrick about. And I have five times more pictures of vintage cars on my phone than of my seven-month-old son. I wanted them to, <laughs> to come see this world that I essentially nerd out about. I'm like Comic-Con weirdo about vintage cars <laughs> when it comes to Porsche. But the way that car events were to me, that I've been dragged to car events since I was young enough to not make the decision, it, it was very stiff. It was quiet, it was um, eccentric, and I wanted it to be something that my wife wanted to come to, that had music, it had food, and it was approachable, but still was engaging for the purest 40, 50 year old veterans that have made their living tuning and restoring these cars. And so we came up with Luftgekult, uh, which essentially means air-cooled in German, and if it's air-cooled and it's Porsche, it's there, and uh, the rest of it we're kind of making up as we go. Yeah, I consider Pat to be an amazing experience designer, and if you ever get a chance to go to one of these events, they're supposed to be totally over the top. I still need to get to one. So we have time for maybe two or three questions from the audience. Um, we're gonna be, if you wanna ask a question, we'll get you a microphone. Don't be shy. Yes, oh, oh, let's actually get the microphone. How often do you practice? either simulator or in car, you know, during the season, how often are you practicing for yeah, so how long? What are, your, what are your training routines like? The interesting part about um, being a racing driver is, is that you can't just take a set of golf clubs and go out and walk 18. You, you can't throw your motocross bike in the back of your truck and go ride on your practice track. You need an infrastructure, you need a team, um, you need a lot of money, tires, fuel. Um, and so we've had to find different ways to hone Patrick's craft and I think to answer your question, um, we, we tried to be in something once a week, um, even in the off season. Uh, what, what my idea for Patrick was to go ahead and sort of go back to the start and, and give him a fair shot at what I had as a kid, which was being thrown into a lot of different scenarios, um, different types of cars, loose gravel surfaces. Um, and, and really what we we're doing is working on balance. Um, I think there's a real direct correlation between balance and car control and what you see when you're counter steering and, and, and moving your hands is you're trying to keep a car from going sideways or drifting. You're trying to be proactive in that. And so what we did is we went to surface where there wasn't a lot of adhesion and you had to do that a lot of times. And you know, going and doing dirt fish and doing a rally a school or driving a 700 pound sprint car that weighs 900 pounds. So much fun. I, I'm trying to throw them out of its comfort zone but also there was a takeaway, conscious and subconscious. Um, simulators are a great way to run through the mental, not so much the physical because it's, it's, it's really about testing your focus. Um, that build up online simulation is great because you're essentially racing 30 people around the world and if you crash, not only do you take someone else out of the race, but you're done. You're not, you don't push reset, it's not Nintendo. You really are in a, 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 an organized race. So that's something that's come along later in my career and something we've worked on a little bit. It's not always easy on the equilibrium. Oh, but, uh, I, I can't do the simulators at all. I get completely sick immediately. I can't even get out of the pits. I'm already like, oh my goodness. <laughs> I tried everything and it just doesn't work. But what it does do, we found this uh, actually at Dirtfish, this small little simulator by PlayStation, wasn't it? What was it? Xbox. And, and, and that helped me tremendously. It, it would help you sort of know where you were going when you got to the track. The elevation really didn't, it wasn't the same, but. What was remarkable for me this year was to, to get a better understanding of what the factory drivers are doing. So they have to do a test, a 12-hour test in Sebring, and they're not racing anybody. They're going out and they're having to pound around for 12 hours. You know, two-hour shifts, how long are your stints in that? And it's like, how do you stay motivated? You're not racing anybody. And, this, it, and that's a challenge physically, uh, emotionally, and, and mentally. How do you stay engaged? And then you start to see them in a race situation and you see how Porsche has developed the drivers, their young drivers, on and off the track, the quality of the, the individuals that do that, and what they do on a day-to-day -day basis is, is phenomenal. They're always in a car, especially the young drivers. They're going somewhere and testing something and developing. And then all of that, 
becomes instinctual for them so that any situation they're in, they know how to react. And that is incredible to me and challenging. So much more respect for the factory drivers than ever before. Great. Another question? Yes, uh, back here behind the camera. Thanks. Uh, endurance racing is hard. Why endurance racing instead of a shorter form of racing? I mean, you've actually done a, a lot of different types of racing. I mean, both of you. But what, what are the, how would you compare and contrast the endurance experience to open wheel or Australian V8s? Like, what, what are some of the big differences? Yeah, I mean, these days, endurance racing, um, the technology, um, the reliability, um, the tire evolution, um, you can drive at a sprint pace for 24 hours, as hard as the car can take it, over curbs, um, red line shifts, threshold braking. So the actual science of driving fast is, is very similar, but the goal with multi-driver, with multi pit stops, it's much more of an adventure, it's much more of a challenge. Um, so, you know, essentially you're going from sprint, running sprints to running a marathon, and it's just a whole different mindset. Um, it, it's, it's one thing to get to the end, but, you know, obsessed with being on top just pushes you through some of the rigors of 3 a.m. I mean, nothing is tougher than being woken up when your body hurts and you're short on sleep and being reminded that you have 15 minutes to be dressed and 20 minutes to be in the pit lane because you're going to be going 200 miles an hour and half an hour from now. That is not fun. I do not look forward to that part of my job, but it makes the success that we found at Le Mans that much sweeter because you're, you're fighting against what really you, you would rather not be doing. I mean, it's that, at that part, it, it's a job. You're like, why, why am I doing this to myself? And then <laughs> you're like, you get in the car and then all of a sudden it, something happens and it's so surreal at night when you're out and you're racing multiple classes and there's so much going on that you, you do wake up. And that thing that it constantly made is the pace of the lap. I mean, it's like qualifying pace. It's remarkable. And it gets faster at night. And um, just the multiple classes and, and the communication that you have with the other drivers is, it, it, it's incredible. The dialogue that goes on in, in, in those races is something else. And you can't make a mistake. The teams that win don't make any mistakes. And that's what's remarkable. Before, you know, you look at the history, it's like if you didn't break down or your brakes didn't fit, you know, that, the drivers would win. They weren't going as fast as, as they are today with the technology. And, and certainly, that's what's really challenging about it, you know, and grueling physically exhausting and, and emotionally draining um, that you, you're like, why do you want to put yourself into this position where it is painful? But something, there's purity in that too. So who would like to ask the penultimate question of the, of the evening? Anyone? Actually, yeah, let's go over here. So question for Patrick. I hope you're finishing your career as a racer and not as an actor. Because I know you as an actor and I want to see, and I know you as a racer, sorry, and I want to see you race more. So. Oh, I do too, definitely. But, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's a question of balance, you know? It's, a, it's the question of the setup of your life. And um, last year was a focus on Le, Le Mans and winning. So it's time to step back for a moment. To stop racing, you know, it's very... Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, think <laughs> I can't answer that question. Essen essentially, what, one thing that Patrick made so clear last year was that 110% commitment, not only in application, but in time, um, in, in what you had to put forward. He gave himself the chance that we're allowed because we do it for a living. And the results were there and they were clear, but it really is something that is an incredible, incredible. Uh, energetic commitment, and I think that it's a, well, the it's goals a balance had been realized. It. I think so. I think there was a there was a shift after Japan, where I was like, okay, I've done it. I've I've checked the box on what the goal was, and now what what would I do going into the season? You know, I was invited back, which was phenomenal, but yet there are all these other things I have to accomplish in my life as well. So that's part of the lesson, I think. 
Yeah, everyone I've ever met who's been involved with motorsports, almost in any kind of way, it changes your life. It changes the way you think, the way you approach life. And so I think once a racer, always a racer. Um, I'd just like to end on one last question for each of you. What are you looking forward to for 2016? What's inspiring to you? Um, I mean, motorsport aside for a minute, I, um, you know, I, just, I look forward to learning more about business, um, about structure and growth and networking. Um, uh, it's something that you know, we've shared a lot of time on. I, I speak to Patrick and ask his advice um, all the time, and, and that's where I'm out to learn. Uh, you know, I obviously hit my marks and race as hard as I can, but again, I feel like I have this gift of a lot of people in this room where I can take a little bit back from the sport and, and uh, ask how to, how to grow on that side of things. Yeah, I think for me, learning, just really focusing on one thing at a time. And last year was about really learning from the Porsche mentality what it means to succeed at such a high level, and now taking that into kids, family, life, career. Focusing on that, I think. Great, well we called it Mindset of a Champion, and I know I feel like I'm gonna walk out of here with a lot more insights on how to live my life to the fullest and be right up there at the top mm -hmm. of the, uh, the grid. So thank you both, Patrick and Patrick. Thank you Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you.